All right, I'll start, Mike, and then send it over to you. All right. All right. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our next USDA consensus webinar, Unlocking the Energy Transition with the Keys to CCUS Commercialization, moderated by our own Mike Moore and featuring some USDA consensus regulars, uh, Mr. Nigel Genvey, partner with Gaffney Klein and Associates, Ken Nemeth with the Southern States Energy Board, Chuck McConnell with the University of Houston and Fred Eames with Hunt Hunton, Andrews and Kurth. Uh, welcome back everyone. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Michelle Littlefield, Program Coordinator with the USDA Consensus Program. And just a little bit about our program itself, uh, formerly named Building Consensus on Carbon Capture, Utilization and Storage, CCUS, and Clean Coal Technologies. Uh, we call this Consensus for short. Um, it's a cooperative agreement with the Department of Energy, Fossil Energy. The program seeks to educate the public policymakers and industry and stakeholders on CCUS and clean coal technologies by hosting webinars such as these. Uh, we have a series of monthly educational briefings, uh, conference workshops, we have technical reports, and we release monthly news clips of CCUS and clean coal related updates. If you would like to join our mailing list, if you have not done so already, feel free to send an email to the address at the bottom of your screen and we will add you to as a subscriber to our consensus mailing list. Uh, so at the end of these uh, sessions, we will have a question and answer portion. Uh, please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to submit a question and we will address as many as we can. Again, thank you all for joining us and I would like to introduce our moderator, Mr. Mike Moore. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. And Michelle, thank you very much for getting us to this point. I couldn't get much done without your assistance, so very much appreciated. Uh, today, we've got... Uh, for people that are familiar to most of the community that's been around the CCUS area for the last 20, I'd say last easy 20 years, 20 anyway, um, a lot of things unfold around us. We've seen stimulus package kick money into places that uh, have stimulated a lot of activity on the on climate change issues. We have seen the, um, the guidance come out, improve guidance on the 45Q that has stimulated a lot of new activity. You've got a, an incredibly strong push on uh, ESG issues with a lot of the companies traditionally in the fossil fuel community that are working very hard on, on transitioning to a, uh, a, a new mode of uh, energy production and distribution and consumption. And, and I think the purpose that we are putting this together is a lot of things are happening in concentrated areas. And one of them has been down around the Houston area, the arc of the Gulf Coast, Texas all the way over past Louisiana, Mississippi, and up into the Midwest. And I figured we'd get this group together that could begin to talk about some of the moving pieces, what's going on, uh, the activities around the 45Q. Chuck McConnell, who's over at University of Houston, has put together a consortium of people to work on this and actually go beyond just having PowerPoints, but see, see projects uh, become part of the program, uh, get built, uh, get into play. And, and Ken Nemeth, who's the uh, executive director for the Southern States Energy Board, whose board is the governors of all the states that are member, members of his association, uh, it see a lot of activity. Each one of the states that make up his area all dropping into this, plus additional areas we won't cover here. It's certainly, I would say, a brave new world. Uh, Fred Eames with Hunt and Williams. Uh, for those that don't know, Hunt and Andrews and Kurth, who don't know Fred, Fred has been in, around the, the CCS, CCUS carbon capture community from regulatory uh, and, uh, and legislative affairs in, in DC. Uh, can read some of this stuff backwards in his sleep. Uh, and then at Nigel Genve over at Baker Hughes, and he's kind of the, the, the global head for carbon management for Baker Hughes. And for those that aren't familiar with them, uh, it'd be worth taking some time to see the areas that they've got, they're involved in, and the areas that they cover. Primarily, had been in the oil and gas sector, but like the other energy related firms, have begun to transition to pieces that tie to it, but may not necessarily be part of the old uh, production and uh, consumption piece of the equation. So with that, I'm going to start this with, uh, we're going to get Nigel to begin giving us some of the working 
high point topical areas of the National Petroleum Council study on CCUS. And why is that those poor, there's some poor principles that came out of this that have become kind of the foundation guide stones to the, uh, to the work that's going on around us right now. And uh, rather than talk anymore, I'm going to turn it over to Nigel. And Nigel, uh, glad you're here. Thank you very much for taking the time. And it's changed even in the last couple of months since we were last together in one of these. So all yours. Many thanks, Mike. Um, really appreciate it. Thank you to the USEA um, and, of course, the US Department of Energy um, for, uh, for making today's uh, webinar possible for everybody in attending as well. Um, definitely to see further engagement by, um, by people into carbon capture use and storage um, really is, uh, is very exciting. Um, and uh, there's, uh, there's new questions and engagement uh, going on um, every day. So it's, uh, it's great to see. Um, I'll be speaking about the, um, to start off with, the, the National Petroleum Council, um, a federal advisory uh, committee to the US Department of Energy and the Secretary of Energy about um, meeting the dual challenge, um, a roadmap to at-scale deployment of CCUS. This was now published back in 2019, December 2019. The website is their dedicated website to the study. It's called Meeting the Dual Challenge. What is the dual challenge? It's, uh, of course, um, re related to increased energy demand in the world as well as increase managing CO2 emissions down. And so that's the dual challenge, trying to supply more energy at scale, as well as reducing CO2 emissions at scale. And what is the role of CCUS? So um, next slide, thanks. Yeah, great. So, um, so the study started in, in September 2017 with the request from the US uh, uh, Secretary of Energy. Basically, we then formulated a, a very large consortia of, uh, of different um, stakeholders, the experts in CCUS from not just oil and gas, but other industries, um, academia, NGOs, state, federal governments, um, consultancies, of course, and um, to really provide input. There was about at least 350 people um, that, uh, that worked on the study from about 100 different organizations, so a, a wide stakeholder range. Um, what we found after about a year and a half wor of work of study is basically that at-scale deployment will mean moving from where we are today, 25 million tonnes per annum of CCUS capacity in the United States to 500 million tonnes per annum. Um, and so that's a significant increase that can be achieved, really, we found over about the next 20, 25 years to, uh, to deliver that. What would that require? Infrastructure build out. Of course, particularly uh, um, important in some of the dis today's discussions around uh, reinvesting um, into US infrastructure. We found that infrastructure need for CCUS, of course, would be volumetrically equivalent to about the US um, um, uh, production of, um, of oil today. Um, so very large volumes, um, and of course, associated with, with that investment, associated with that investment, significant support for additional jobs and GDP. So a lot of benefits to the economy from that level of investment, as well as, of course, the environmental benefits and continued leadership in the world. Now, what does it require? So the keys, the four general areas and keys for CCUS deployment at scale, we found were improved policies, incentives, regulations, and legislation, broad-based innovation and technology development, strong collaboration between industry and government, and increased understanding and confidence in CCUS. So those four keys, we've, we felt, really summarize what's needed to deliver that scale up. Next slide, please. Now we built all of the NPC study um, 
findings, recommendations, insights from really understanding the cost of deployment at large scale across the entire United States on a national assessment level. This shows, uh, this graph shows what that cost variation looks like. And of course, policies and incentives and regulations need to take into account those fundamental different sectors that CCUS is deployed into. A few examples pulled out there in the red colors. The variation in cost and the scale, of course, of, uh, of deployment that can be achieved, as well as how this would be financed. Next slide, please. So on that, we built and identified really three phases of deployment. The first activation phase around providing clarity to those existing policies that had been put in place, really in order to secure monetization of those for project developers. And that was mainly, of course, around 45Q. We're glad to see a lot of engagement and alignment within industry around what the real keys that needed to be clarified in that are. The action taken by um, federal agencies and the IRS, DOE and EPA. And we now have indeed a lot of those, most of those clarifications provided um, at the end of last year. The expansion phase, that's the next phase. That's really where the focus is now. What's next in order to really build upon activating CCUS deployment? Now that is around amending 45Q. There's some bills in place to, uh, to do that, but also to think about other policies that can come into place to really support the investment cost. So 45Q is effectively a production tax credit. It's paid over time and therefore it helps with mainly operating cost to help with the capital, capital commitments and investment tax credit under section 48 would be more suitable. And there's a lost, long list of other ways to improve financing and deployment potential um, within the expansion phase. Then later on at scale deployment, of course, once we've uh, got a certain level of deployment, we then look for more market-based mechanisms with, that allow us to uh, um, really deploy into much larger scales um, within the economy. And, uh, and you can see the recommendations and the levels of price there. And so all of this work was based upon a certain viewpoint of today's technologies. Next slide, please. And of course, technology makes advances all of the time. And so what technology and the, the little inset diagram basically is the technology readiness levels of various technologies that capture CO2, compress transport CO2, use CO2, store CO2, or use it for enhanced oil recovery, various technologies and readiness levels. And new technologies and ways to do things, of course, help with reducing cost and increase the breadth of deploy deployment. And so in order to bring those technologies up to be ready for commercial deployment requires investment and time and effort. Of course, there's a large ecosystem already in place in the United States for that, but it needs further support and expansion. What could it deliver? We believed it could deliver, of course, some significant cost improvements. You can see there on that previous gray chart, the level of type of, uh, of cost improvements. If that happens, then it, it, we were able to achieve much broader, larger deployment of CCUS than the 500 million tons per annum. And it will cost, of course, us less to deliver. The importance of technology and continued innovation. Next slide. Slide, please. And a strong collaboration between industry and government. Of course, CCUS is underpinned by policies and supported by, uh, by regulations that are performance-based. And of course, in order to do that, we will require a lot of industri industrial investment into deployment of the infrastructure and of course, jobs in the economy as a result. And of course, this map really shows likely areas of CCRS deployment over time in those phases of implementation. The level 
um, of investment required and the amount of CCUS that, uh, that would be resultant. So in order to do that, industry and government need to continue to work together. Next slide, please. And then um, lastly, but, but not least, and having been involved um, in CCUS for, for indeed a long time, um, to build increased understanding. Today's webinar hopefully will continue that pathway and confidence, importantly, in CCUS within broad stakeholders. And so we, there, was a, there was a chapter on just this, uh, these, this issue within the NPC report. Um, and uh, here you'll see the framework really that we're presenting that on, that of course it comes in various different spheres of public engagement in CCUS around, of course, project stakeholder engagement, around policy stakeholder engagement, and then finally, of course, public stakeholder engagement and various steps in here. So some good observations and some recommendations in order to continue to do that, to build understanding, confidence in CCRS. And last, last slide, and then uh, looking forward to hearing from uh, the other esteemed panelists today um, and having a discussion with them. Basically, all of this was summarized in the roadmap and all of the recommendations, including details of those recommendations, are captured within the study. And indeed, please feel free to, uh, to go onto the website, download it electronically, and peer through the, uh, the, the report. It's a wealth of information and, uh, and encourage you to do so. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, Nigel, thank you very much for that piece. And I don't know if we explained that in the beginning. You had a fairly leading role in the, in, in the development of the study, certain components of it. So it, for you, there's a very intimate relationship to the, to, the, to the information, the outcomes, and also how this can be uh, put to use. Uh, we would encourage people to reach out to Nigel after the fact and uh, follow up with him on that study and some of its attributes. Our next speaker up here will be uh, Ken Nemeth, who's the executive director for the Southern States Energy Board and uh, again, I've known Ken probably 20 plus years. I got quite a, quite a role to keep all the states in line and, and, uh, and keep all the governors happy and uh, all the state delegations that he deals with. He's been in this space since day one. And with no ado, I'm gonna turn this over to you, uh, Ken, and, and uh, go from there. Thanks for your kind introduction, Mike. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. And I appreciate this invitation from the United States Energy Association. Uh, when I think of USEA, my thoughts are always of Barry Worthington, a good friend and colleague of many years who was taken from us way too early. Barry was also a great convener of government and industry experts to discuss regional challenges to energy issues and energy access in developing countries. And I'm pleased to know that his legacy will carry us on through timely and informational forums of relevance to the global energy industry like the one today. On March 23rd, John Kerry, the president's climate envoy, addressed the Institute of International Finance's 2021 Washington Policy Summit. He said he believed the private sector was more likely to find solutions to climate change than government. Quote, I was convinced and remain convinced no government is gonna solve this problem, Kerry said in his remarks at the summit. He continued, the solution is gonna come from the private sector and what government needs to do is create the framework within which the private sector can do what it does best, which is to allocate capital and innovate and begin to take the framework that's been created. We need to go after this as if we're really at war, close quote. Southern States Energy Board has heard this call to action and we are proceeding accordingly. As some of you know, Southern States Energy Board is comprised of Southern governors and legislative leaders from 16 states, two territories, and a federal representative appointed by the President of the United States. Created in 1960, we're unique among American organizations, having both a federal and a state mandate. Our mission is to enhance economic development and the quality of life in the South, 
through innovations in energy and environmental programs, policies, and technologies. In 2003, our chairman, former West Virginia Governor Bob Wise, established the board's carbon management program. This initiative began the board's focus of R&D &D on carbon dioxide capture, utilization, and storage technologies. And that project was initiated when uh, we received one of seven DOE awards to manage the regional carbon sequestration partnership in the Southeast that we call CCARB. Currently in its third phase, CCARB has received many awards and international recognitions for its significant achievements in advancing CCUS technology. There are too many achievements and technology advances to discuss during this short time, but I do want to mention that an integrated CCUS demonstration project in South Alabama at Plant Berry led to the commercial scale up of the system at Petra Nova near Houston, Texas. Building on the expertise gained at CCARB, SSCB and its partners have expanded the board's carbon management program to include a rescoped continuation of the regional partnership that emphasizes R&D approaches to resolving remaining technical and non-technical challenges to commercial CCUS deployment. This effort is called CCARB USA. A DOE carbon safe project in Mississippi that establishes regional CO2 storage uh, is next. That storage complex is being designed, developed, and permitted. Two of three stratigraphic characterization wells have been drilled to date, and class six UIC permitting activities will follow soon. We've recently completed assessments of industrial CCUS opportunities in the Appalachian region and also in Southwest Arkansas. Another project now completed focuses on CCUS opportunities in the offshore environment. Uh, and in a current offshore assessment, our partners are examining the Eastern Gulf of Mexico. Uh, in fact, that project is upstairs in our office right now, also on a webinar. We also have a new direct air capture technology project that will be the first test of its kind at the National Carbon Capture Center in Wilsonville, Alabama. Over the years, several states have established laws to incentivize commercial CCUS deployment. And you know, we don't talk enough about the states. One of the things that we do is we continue to say, well, the feds are gonna do this, the feds are gonna do that, Congress is gonna do this, but we don't focus on what the states are doing and have done. So I've tried to include these today, and if my talk ranges a little bit long from everyone else's, uh, I just put these in yesterday. So these range from tax credits to reducing uncertainties in liability and permitting, uh, of course, across the United States, several hundred bills and regulations related to CO2 have been proposed, although only a small fraction have been enacted. Examples, not a comprehensive list, are provided on, the, on this slide and encompass topics <clears throat> such as, <clears throat> excuse me, such as poor space and CO2 ownership, long-term liability, tax incentives, such as severance tax, ad valorem, sales tax, and franchise tax, eminent domain, and CCUS and EOR laws that specify state organizational jurisdiction over CO2 injection wells, pipeline transport of CO2, and other related issues. I think it's significant that nine states have, have gone into the poor space area. Nine states have, have, uh, have limited risk from long-term liability. Uh, other uh, states, seven states have passed tax incentives. Five states have passed eminent domain uh, and so forth. So I think this is rather significant. Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi were our first movers when it came to enacting laws to incentivize CCUS. When we get requests from states that want to enhance their legal and regulatory framework to support CCUS commercialization, we encourage them first to examine the laws in these states. Some of the highlights from Texas are on this slide. Highlights from Louisiana and Mississippi laws are outlined on this slide. Notably, Louisiana is the first of our member states to apply for primacy over class six 
UIC well permitting and the Secretary of Natural Resources and State Energy Office Director have been actively educating industry in their state on the state incentives. Also, Mississippi state law requires them to pursue class six primacy. In late 2020, the board recast one of its partnerships with the, with the United States Department of Energy to focus on the commercialization of technologies necessary to develop CCUS projects on a large scale. Utilizing our vast cadre of partners, individuals, and organizations present since the board's initial carbon capture and sequestration partnership in 2003, the University of Houston was selected as the ideal partner to assist SSEB in pursuing these goals. Located in the heart of one of the nation's major oil and gas industries, our UH team provides us with instant entry and access to the energy industry's major financial and innovation hubs. As many in energy companies already are associate members of, of the board, we have an even greater opportunity to, to create a valued government industry partnership that can transcend the barriers associated with innovation of new technologies. The US, UH team is led by Charles McConnell, the former Assistant Secretary of Energy in the Obama administration and a spirited longtime champion of CCUS, whom you'll hear from later in the program. The project provides a regional effort that fosters and sustains an innovative environment for the development of CCUS policies and technologies. Its primary features are to foster and facilitate communication, education, and outreach between DOE, the governors, legislative leaders within the SSEB region, state agencies, utilities, regulatory bodies, the private sector, and nonprofits. We also support global outreach to promote the adoption of US technologies and internationally and provide greater opportunities for US companies in a globally challenging environment. We also will be briefing state policymakers and regulators on the historical and current technical aspects of clean energy demonstration programs to gain support and regulatory approval for future commercial deployment and on establishing a public-private partnership consortium of experts to promote the rapid and transformational deployment of CCUS technologies. Currently, we're engaged in two very important tasks, the creation of a leadership consortium to champion CCUS commercialization and a roadmap that will provide the blueprint necessary to achieve success. We know that the Biden administration wants to see more deployment of CCUS projects, in particular because green hydrogen production with CCUS, uh, direct air capture, bioenergy CCUS, and CCUS with hard to decarbonize industries. And here I'm talking about cement and steel and so forth to meet their emission reduction goals. CO2 trunk line network is also of great importance as we consider how CCUS can be a more important catalyst for climate change. The most important words in Washington these days seem to be decarbonization and emissions reduction. I think that's true based on what I'm seeing from the Biden administration. Many of our heavy industries and power producers are moving further in, in this direction, even without prompting from government regulators. In 1992, I like to say that the winning catchphrase <clears throat> in the presidential election was, it's the economy stupid. We all remember that. In 2021, we need to be saying, it's the emissions stupid. Isn't that what everybody wants, low to no emissions? Can we favor an all of the above policy that allows all fuels and resources to complete? Have we not learned that picking winners and losers always has proven to be a bad idea and yet it seems to keep happening? The solution to pollution is to stimulate the development of what I call transformative technologies and enable those innovations to spirit us into the future. 
recently a former three-time chairman of the Southern States Energy Board, now the chair of the U.S. Senate Committee on Energy and Natural Resources, spoke to this issue. He said, the transition to a cleaner energy future must come through innovation, not elimination. When we think about a cleaner energy future, what we also need to focus on is, hey, where are the developing countries in all of this? How are they positioned and when are they going to be ready to espouse what are considered to be cleaner technology? America can become a, can become a country of fewer choices when it comes to fuels and technologies, but that doesn't save the developing world still stuck on dung and other low cost regional energy sources. Rapid growth demands more energy and the advanced fuels and technologies to utilize it. Eliminating entire energy sources, choices, and fuels is not the answer. The most effective paths we believe to decarbonization and emission reduction is to enable innovation to lead the marketplace to the most effective tools. Carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere reached a milestone 421 parts, 421 parts per million last weekend, the highest concentration in 3.6 million years, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. This has caused President Biden to call for a virtual world leaders summit of 40 countries in two weeks to further pressure countries that have not done enough to curb the CO2 release from human activity. The president is acting, asking the federal government to spend an additional $14 billion on tackling climate change in his budget request for FY22. And yet, when we look at what the departments are getting, EPA with a 21.3% increase, Department of the Interior with a 16% increase, the Energy Department, which has been asked to accelerate demonstration, commercialization of innovative, transformative, transformative zero emission energy technologies is getting 10%. The administration defines green jobs as those associated with developing, building, operating, and maintaining renewable systems like windmills. This green job definition is not official, but these are the examples that are used to indicate that people who used to work in the coal industry should be retrained to do new jobs. It locally follows that uh, or that, that, that green jobs are those associated uh, more closely with that industry, but also with zero carbon, carbon neutral, and especially carbon or CO2 negative energy sources. Therefore, all jobs associated with developing, constructing, deploying, retrofitting, operating, maintaining such energy systems are green jobs, including systems using technologies such as CCS, CCUS, BECCUS, and retrofitable transformative technologies, such as oxycombustion and others, providing they eliminate all CO2 emissions, or even better, provide net negative CO2 emissions. The latter systems, plants, and technologies would emit less CO2 than renewables. By extension, fuels that are needed to power zero or net negative CO2 systems could be defined as clean fuels, including those from gas and coal. Additionally, a large number of well-paying green jobs can be created in developing, building, operating, and maintaining net zero and net negative CO2 plants. This also translates to producing hydrogen from gas, or BECCUS, with net negative CO2 emissions. One could even include coal to products in this category if the products are produced and used with zero or net negative CO2 emissions and reduce our dependence on critical materials from China. And of course, air capture of CO2 is another innovation being tested by us and others as well as carbon capture and storage of CO2. Thanks for the opportunity to be with you today. Now, my pleasure, turn the mic back over to our moderator, Michael Moore. Ken, as always, it's, it's great to have you and hear your insights and appreciate the, the friendship we've had over the years and the work that you guys are doing at Southern States Energy Board. Um, there's a lot on the plate now. And, um, and again, thank you for taking your time 
out of your busy day today. It's uh, I know it's been hectic and really appreciate that. And we're gonna do we'll do Q and A when we get done with uh, when Fred is finished with his piece. I'm gonna turn this over now to uh, uh, to I call him Chuck Charles McConnell, who's the executive director for the Carbon Management and Sustainability Center at University of Houston. Chuck's got a a long list of accomplishments. It's on his bio. I won't sit here and read them to you, but he is in a position to not just see change, but help affect it as well. And uh, Chuck, thank you very much for being able to be with us today. You know, appreciate your insights and friendships as well. You're down in Houston. Um, you're kind of in the, in the middle of the heartbeat of what's happening down in, we'll say down in Texas right now, but to all the area surrounding it. And um, with that, it's yours, sir. Well, Mike, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks to you and USCA for the platform and, and frankly, for, you know, the, the ability to be amongst the other three panelists who I consider not only uh, colleagues and, and well-learned in the industry, but certainly friends as well as yourself, Mike. Um, I'm also a little bit nervous when you and Ken refer to me as Charles it's almost like you want something <laughs> or, or my mother scolding me. But, uh, I, but anyway, I, I, I do know who you're speaking to. So uh, we'll, we'll put the slide deck up right now if we could, Alex. And, and I think the, the important part that I'd like to build on, first of all, thank you to Ken for the kind words about the establishment of the, the CCUS Commercialization Consortia in the Southern region and the importance that the Department of Energy put into that. Uh, we, we take that responsibility very seriously. We're delighted to have over 25 companies that have already signed up in oil and gas, petrochemicals, electric power, NGOs, you name it. Uh, we've got quite an array of participation and we're certainly excited about that. And it's gonna be a big part of our effort going forward. I also wanna, as I begin to this, to this conversation today around a low carbon energy capital project that we looked at this summer and produced something really on the heels of what Nigel Genvey spoke about. After the National Petroleum Council study came out, it was very clear also in that as we looked across the broad base of the United States that there were some particular hubs and clusters around the country that were gonna be particularly well suited for the activation phase. Let's get moving, let's get going. And certainly from a standpoint of why Houston was chosen, you know, we all know why CCUS is essential and it is essential, I wanna highlight that. It's not an option that we're evaluating, but the IPCC has made it very clear that it is really an essential part of achieving climate targets. The impacts, not simply to perpetuate the hydrocarbon industry, not at all, it's really to most effectively have the energy transition occur. And, and that's on the heels of several of the aspects of the energy transition, including hydrogen, decarbonizing the electric power industry, uh, the ability to effectively make the circular plastics economy work. The CCUS infrastructure and set of that is, is really essential. And in Houston, we have an unprecedented kind of position, I guess, globally, in terms of the cluster of where those emissions are, the vast, vast proximal geology resources, both for storage and for enhanced oil recovery, and the energy companies that are here headquartered that themselves have declared their aspirations to get to a lower carbon future some declaring themselves net zero by some period of time. And in fact, the city of Houston moving in that same direction. So all the arrows pointing in the right direction and utilizing the Houston hub and cluster centerpiece as a way to effectively get moving rapidly. Next slide. So we took the objectives and, and maybe you can advance it forward one more. The objectives and the findings really get to the point where we took this to the, uh, the construct of, this, of the uh, NPC study and, and regionalized specifically for the Gulf Coast in terms of the facilities, the costs, the cost structure, 
and looking at not only the emissions, but also the economic impact in and around the Houston area. And I would call that the extended Gulf Coast. And as we look at positioning CCUS as both an opportunity to do pure storage, to also do enhanced oil recovery with safe and permanent long-term storage of CO2, or both, and having the optionality around that with the unique geology that we have. And clearly what we came up with were some findings that said, this is strategic investment. It's not wildly accretive investment today, but as Nigel suggested, the roadmap going forward is one in which we take advantage of what we've got today in the circumstances that can make it accretive enough for investment and then through that to be able to grow our knowledge, know-how, have technology improve, et cetera. We think a mix of EOR and pure storage is also a big part of the investment portfolio. And of course, federal, state, and local government policies must support it. And I would, I would have to say that the assessment that Ken made and his comments around states getting behind this effectively a big part of the solution here. It's not just the federal government. Next slide. So what we did, and again, this is not new to anybody here, but we looked at the capture, transport, and storage pieces of the value proposition. There are headwinds in each of these areas, but headwinds that are less in this hub and cluster region of Houston and the Gulf Coast in terms of capture and having the proximal um, emission sources Having transportation with existing pipeline systems and the ability to construct additional pipeline systems for infrastructure, really important to be able to move this forward rapidly and cost effectively. And finally, the storage, I mentioned the proximal geology, and that's not just onshore, but it's offshore as well, as Ken highlighted. And, and as we see this going forward, this part of the country can become a repository for storage for the entirety of the United States in some areas where storage isn't all that easy to do. And we think we have that as a first mover opportunity to move into these key area challenges. Next slide, please. So what we did is we looked at uh, uh, the construct of it is how do we take the greater Houston region to net zero, put them in the three phases, 10 years each and looked at the individual point sources of emissions, the actual costs to invest in the emissions removal of that CO2, getting it fit for purpose, putting it then into a pipeline system to get it to the geology it needed to get to. And as you can see across the X axis here, a number of specific things such as steam methane reformers, natural gas combined cycle power plants, discharges from refinery and, um, chemical plant operations and other industrial operations. And what we did was rank order those facilities. And you can see here the total of them summing to 52 at the end of that period of time. And again, that's in a very discrete area. I want to thank Nigel Genvey and the Gaffney Klein organization to be a big part of this research because we went to the actual ground level at each of these facilities, located them on a map and put costs associated with each of them. So it's not a general look, it's a very specific look. Next slide. And you can advance through this as you see the three phases. So in phase one, we took advantage, you can see here the facilities that are identified here. Uh, these are steam methane reformers and natural gas combined cycle power plants in and around the Houston area with the proximity to the Denbury pipeline existing today which operates actually only one third capacity. So we've got about 13 million tons per year of available capacity that we can actually get into that pipeline. We can begin to actually activate this program by putting the capture facilities in place, running short trunk lines and getting into that Denbury pipeline. And so this is a very unique circumstance around the country, frankly, around the world. If you go to the next slide, what it really also shows is that pipeline then going east into other storage areas for both EOR as well as pure storage. And you can see we have a phenomenal amount in terms of billions of tons of capacity that's available just from this short pipeline run that's already existing today. 
And I say short because we're really talking about overall broadly looking at vast regions of the country that need to reach to be able to get into these geologic systems. But we've got a really good start and for the next 10 years believe that it could be incredibly important to move forward. Often the question gets asked, do we have enough storage? Yes, we've got plenty of storage. And you can see here just in the identified area, 75 years worth of available storage to move forward on. But that's just phase one. Go to the next slide, please. What we then did is looked at the phase one realities. We put it into a discounted cash flow model and modeled it as if we were looking at an investment opportunity that any one of us would be involved in our businesses. We put the actual costs in, we looked at 20 year curve, we looked at the, the scenarios that we could also envision, whether it's EOR, 100% storage, or either. And we've got switches based in the model to be able to do that. Took a look at a cost of capital that we would assume to go into it, and then made some incoming assumptions in terms of what would the economics look like if we made this investment. And again, that's on the totality of the value chain, not individual discrete portions of the value chain, but the entirety of it. And if you go to the next slide, what it does is it pops very quickly the key sensitivities in terms of this model. Now this case in specific, we ran at 100% EOR, and you can see the sensitivity results on the price of oil, the oil recovery, the, the actual CapEx necessary to put in place to actually capture the CO2 and the, and the 45Q rate. And you can see those are the mo more sensitive items in our sensitivity analysis, but it's got an entire range of that. And for anybody considering CCUS anywhere, this model can then become a baseline for you to be able to take whatever modeling you're looking at and take it to the level and the specificity that you're looking at. In this case, we were able to come to a positive NPV, 12% IRR with 100% EOR, but it required a $40 barrel price on oil over the next 20 years and several of the other assumptions that were built into the model. Now it's not based upon something that we believe is either correct or incorrect. It's simply the construct of the modeling required to get you to the answer that whatever it is you're pursuing. In this case, what we proved we believe is there can be a case made for an increative business investment in CCUS, in the Gulf Coast, in the hubs and clusters that we're working with. Now, of course, everybody in the value chain doesn't have the same impression of risks, rewards, capital cost hurdles, opportunity cost, all of those things are business analysis items that are gonna to have to come together. But what we said was at the end of this, we can make a case that investment today can be accretive and investment tomorrow can be positioned properly. So go to the next slide, please. And I'll get close to wrapping up here. Page forward a couple of, uh, as well. Phase one, phase two, and then ultimately phase three. And what we're looking at doing is over time, getting the capture in place at all of those 52 sites. And again, that's just the proximal area in and around Houston. But if we extend that throughout the Gulf Coast, east of New Orleans, south to Corpus, and looking at the entirety of it all, and then envisioning stretching west to the Permian, northwest up into the Dallas-Fort Worth area for geologies up in that region, we can begin to envision that the study that Nigel did and has described with us from the NPC of the amount of tonnage of CO2, we could make a case that perhaps as much or more that 50% of the overall CO2 that we're going after as a nation can actually come from that hub and cluster in and around the US Gulf Coast. That's the extended version of it all, certainly. But we believe that using this as a model, it can be the same model for Singapore or, or, or Beijing or Rotterdam or any of the places around the world that are looking at this because clusters are gonna be a real key to making this happen. And so with that, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll cede back to you, Mike, 
but hopefully this gives people an understanding that the work's been done in terms of the model that's been created and we'd be happy to engage with uh, with others that are interested in maybe doing modeling in other places around the country do want to thank not only Gaffney Klein but also Jane Stricker from BP, Mike Godick from ARI, Steve Melzer, who we all know out in the Permian area, as well as Scott Nyquist from McKinsey. And of course, uh, my colleague, Nigel Genvey. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Jeff, you're very welcome and thank you for that. The um, work that's been done to outline and define how the process will work, uh, kind of a baseline model <clears throat> is, is critical now. You, people are looking, they're, I think everybody, every one of us today probably are involved in something that we're, we're under a CA or NDA about a lot of activities evolving across the board and um, really appreciate what you've got going at U of H with your team and your work there. It's certainly going to help encourage people to uh, dig into their opportunities, probably more so than we would have seen in the past. We certainly see the activity from the outside coming in. Um, with the uh, with our next speaker, Fred Eames, again, great pleasure to work with Fred on a number of levels and a number of different capacities, known each other a long time, uh, very well known up in D.C. for his, his work on policy, legislative, regulatory affairs in the energy sector. And, uh, and with that, Fred, I'm going to put you on and let you have a run at it. And again, when we're done, when Fred finishes up, we'll go to Q&A. And we've, we've left a fair amount of time for Q&A, where it's not going to be a quick five, five questions. We're going to be in a, maybe even a series of some minor debates amongst the other speakers. So, Fred, uh, my good friend, it is all yours. Thanks very much, Mike. And uh, I always appreciate the opportunity to participate on these because uh, uh, I've always got the opportunity to learn something. You know, I uh, have spent a lot of time over the years with Mike, Ken, Chuck, Nigel, uh, uh, but uh, always an opportunity to uh, learn from these. And uh, that's certainly been the case today. I'm Fred Eames. I'm a partner in the Washington, D.C. office of Hunt and Andrews Kurth. And I've served on Capitol Hill for about a decade as a legislative staffer in that committee council on the Energy and Commerce Committee uh, prior to entering private practice. And over the last dozen years or more, I've focused, uh, among other things, on CCUS, formed a couple of coalitions, including one with Mike. Uh, and I'm very pleased to join Chuck and Nigel and Ken on this panel today. And thanks to Mike, Michelle, Alex, and, uh, and the uh, USEA for hosting this event. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the three things we're gonna, that I'm gonna talk about here. Uh, following up on what we've heard from Chuck and Nigel and Ken, I'm gonna provide some perspective on the status of CCUS commercialization. You know, lawyers are in a position to see project interest prior to public announcements. And obviously I can't reveal client information, but I'll give a brief overall sense of what we're seeing. And then I'll discuss barriers or threats to CCUS and then some CCUS opportunities. Uh, so next slide, please. So let's talk about the status of CCUS. There is no question in my mind that at least in the time that I've been involved in CCUS, the interest is at an all time high. I mean, we're fielding calls from many clients who are considering projects right now, and some who have already, they've gone beyond considering and they're, uh, uh, they're working on them. There are companies that are looking for CO2 for enhanced oil recovery projects. There are emitters that are looking to capture CO2 either for the benefit of the uh, Section 45Q tax credit or to lower their carbon footprint or both. There are financial services companies with a tax appetite that are looking for investments that'll yield a tax credit stream. And there are others out there. Uh, and we've all seen the project announcements from various companies. We've seen formation of low carbon business units, including for the uh, companies listed on the screen here. Uh, they're looking for uh, good investment opportunities and so on. And this is just more evidence that CCUS is hitting its stride. And it's really driven by several things. Uh, the, the Section 45Q federal tax credit which as of January finally has interpretive rules around it from the Treasury Department. And I would add that they're, uh, that they're favorable rules uh, for, for CCUS. 
Uh, it's also driven by the need for low carbon operations that are reliable. And we know that fossil fuels are highly reliable energy resources and CCUS is the pathway, really the pathway to low GHG emissions uh, using fossil fuels, whether you combust the fossil fuels directly or whether you convert them to hydrogen, you're gonna need CCUS. And finally, it's driven by a societal, and by that I mean beyond government, focus on climate change. 2021 is a lot different than 2009 uh, when, you know, at the federal level here, everybody expected a cap and trade bill to be enacted. Corporations today are moving irrespective of climate regulation. And I think that's an important uh, factor to uh, consider. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So um, we know, okay, we know that CCUS is essential to meeting international climate targets. Uh, the well-respected International Energy Agency and others uh, are telling us that. And if we have to trust the climate science, we have to trust the emissions math too, okay? We're gonna need CCUS to meet international climate targets, period. But there are some significant barriers that still need to be overcome that'll slow down CCUS and could possibly derail them. And first I think is what I consider to be anyway, just dogmatic opposition to fossil fuels. And now this opposition has been around for all of my 30 plus years in Washington and well before that but never has it been so well-funded, so widely held and so consequential as it is today, okay? And since CCUS is essential to meeting climate goals, we really need a public discourse that reinforces that, not one that undermines it. And companies that are concerned about the public perception of how green they are, ought to get the same sort of praise for supporting investment in CCUS as they would if they invested in renewables. Frankly, they ought to get more praise for that and uh, more plaudits because it's, it's less popular, uh, but it's no less important. And if companies won't invest in CCUS because anything fossil related is unpopular, we don't meet the climate targets and we have less reliable energy and costs go up, okay? Now, fortunately, the bipartisan support in Congress for CCUS is stronger now than ever, but you know, boardroom decisions aren't made based on what Congress thinks. So again, I think this public debate is very important. And of course, on the screen, I've got some information about some comments that have been made relatively recently that are disparaging towards CCUS. Uh, next slide, please. And I would add, uh, going back to that last slide, you don't need to flip back to it, but I would add that there are, there are a number of environmental groups that are out there that are supportive of CCUS. The Clean Air Task Force, Environmental Defense Fund has been working on it, Third Way, many others. So uh, certainly uh, clear path as well. Uh, so uh, all doing good work. Now this, this chart here is something I've presented previously um, uh, and Nigel told me he liked it previously, so I thought I would bring it back. Uh, Regulatory barriers are one of the other two key impediments to CCUS, the other being cost. And I'm not gonna discuss cost too much today. Uh, Chuck has gone through some of that, Nigel can, uh, but I am, we are gonna spend some time on regulatory issues. And um, this kind of looks at the pros and cons of CCS, okay, which is, uh, we'll define here for purposes of this as storage without making use of the CO2 and CCUS, where the CO2 is put to use. And by far the most common use today is enhanced oil recovery. So we'll discuss that a little bit. So on CCS, you know, on the pro side, you get a higher tax credit under section 45Q, $50 a ton as opposed to 35. There's really no environmentalist opposition to using the CO2 to produce more fossil fuels that generate more CO2 because you're not doing that. And there's less trouble lining up the economic imperatives of the emitting entity and the off-taker. Uh, that is, if I'm an industrial facility that's producing the CO2, I don't really need to worry that the oil field where I'm sending my CO2 might be shut down because the oil market price is low and they can't make a profit at that moment because I'm sending my CO2 to saline storage. But on the other hand, regulation for CCS disposal uh, under CCS is more difficult than it is for CO2 EOR. There's a much bigger project footprint. 
And we also don't know as much about the ability of saline formations to maintain containment. Uh, now we do have some history, a lot of that is, uh, has been studied, but it's certainly not nearly as extensive as we have for oil formations. And the fact that we don't have quite as much information causes some people to worry about long-term liability risks. I would say, personally, I feel the long-term liability risk seems manageable. Uh, there have been a number of uh, developments over the year that show that risk to be manageable. There are commercial risk management instruments that are available out there to handle that. Uh, but the issue, nevertheless, comes up uh, relatively frequently. Now, on the other side, for CCUS, specifically CO2 EOR, you've got well-known low-risk uh, containment. You've got a smaller storage footprint and an appropriately lighter-handed regulatory structure. But the emitter and the oil field operator both need to worry about how frequently and for how long the other will be operating. Uh, you get a lower 45Q tax credit, although generally you do get, you know, the emitter gets paid for the CO2 by the off-taker in that case. And some environmentalists, of course, don't like that you're producing more fossil fuels, so you do have public perception risk. Now, I, would, I do note at the bottom there that an off-taker may have dual capability to put it not only in CO2 EOR, but also to put it in uh, dedicated storage. Next slide, please. So a uh, little more uh, on regulatory barriers. What I worry about over the next few years is whether there will be attempts by the administration to make CO2 EOR more difficult to do and to push companies towards CCS only, not CCUS. And that would have a couple of bad effects. Uh, first, we, need to, we really need to think of oil produced by a CCUS as low carbon oil. The emissions from combustion on the back end are offset to a degree by storage of the CO2 in the oil formation during the production process. And if the world is going to keep using oil for years to come, and it is, would you rather have production involve the storage of CO2 or not? Uh, I mean, it's, it's a pretty simple question, and it should be a pretty simple answer. I mean, oil today comes from both, but we, we certainly ought to be uh, uh, happier with uh, uh, production that, uh, that involves some storage. And making CO2 EOR regulations tougher to discourage people from doing that really hurts low carbon oil. The second thing is, if we actually build the amount of cap carbon capture projects that we need in order to hit the emission reduction targets, we're going to run into a permitting capacity problem with the EPA and the states on class six permits, okay, for dedicated CCS storage, okay. And that's going to get worse if we push people away from CO2 EOR and toward class two storage. CO2 EOR generally is permitted at the states, not, at the, uh, not by the EPA. Um, so there are proposals in Congress to give EPA more money for class six permitting, and that's good. And we've also heard that the EPA has been moving pretty quickly on Louisiana's application to run the class six program, uh, which Ken mentioned, and that's great. For things to move quickly, we're going to need to have the states in the lead. We're going to need their resources. And before I leave this page, I want to mention a couple more uh, potential CCUS barriers. First, while permitting can be tough, the general uh, the regulatory process does provide some stability, okay? It's a potential barrier to CCUS that public opinion can turn on your project. The public should have a say in what happens in our communities, but if companies react only to the loudest voices, nothing's going to get built. Um, second, I'm wary of what I would call dynamic valuation by the government of costs and benefits on certain projects. I haven't seen this yet from the uh, current administration, but they are in their early days. And uh, the concern is that favored, quote unquote, clean energy projects might get a better cost benefit evaluation standard than disfavored ones, which would skew the market toward a particular outcome. I haven't seen that. I'm not positing specific pathways for that to happen, but I'm just kind of keeping alert to that possibility. We want CCS and CCUS, both of them to be uh, favored. And so far the Biden administration has been uh, very positive on CCUS. Next slide, please. Uh, now I'm, I'm not gonna spend much time on this slide, but I'll just note that it's tough to build anything these days that requires a government permit or review process. And that's especially true for linear infrastructure like CO2 pipelines, which may have to cross wetlands, rivers, 
endangered species habitat, migratory bird habitat, or historically significant areas. And we've got federal statutes for all of those things, not to mention for air emissions. And a major focus of the Biden administration so far is on environmental justice. I can't tell you precisely how environmental justice considerations are gonna affect review of proposed projects. Some of the definitions of an environmental justice community that we've seen are very broad. Uh, and depending on where the emitting project is to be located, it could complicate the process of getting approvals. That's all I'll mention with respect to that, especially in a heavily industrialized area, which is, again, you know, to Chuck's point about clusters, that's where this is likely to uh, start first. Next slide, please. So this is just an illustration on this uh, page of the uh, chart that I had of CCS versus CCUS a couple of slides ago. It's, a, it's an illustration I got from an industry colleague showing the difference in affected area between a CO2 EOR project, which is in yellow there, versus a dedicated CCS project that would sequester roughly the same amount of CO2 in saline storage. Now, as you look at those two areas, the yellow and the blue, consider the property rights that need to be acquired, the agreements from landowners, environmental review and related issues. And this illustrates some of the differences from the CCS versus CCUS chart. Next slide, please. Now we wanna close this presentation on a high note. There are barriers, but remember where I started a few minutes ago. These are barriers that companies obviously are overcoming because like I said, we're seeing interest in CCUS and project development at an all time high. So where are the opportunities to pro promote CCUS even more? Well, first there are a number of proposals in Congress. I don't follow the states uh, as closely, but I, I take Ken's point about uh, we really do need to focus more on the states and there are state proposals as well to encourage CCUS. Okay, several of the congressional proposals to mention include the following extension and enhancement of the Section 45Q tax credit. Congress just extended the deadlines for projects to be under construction to January 1st, 2026, and a recently introduced bill would extend that even further to 2031. There's also legislation to increase the credit for direct air capture to $120 a ton for CO2 stored in dedicated or non-productive storage and 75 a ton for uh, enhanced oil recovery. Those are huge numbers, but they're in line with what studies have found are the direct air capture costs. Actually, they're probably still below that, but uh, uh, considerably higher than under current law. And moreover, there's legislation out there to encourage the build out of a CO2 pipeline network uh, to set up the, the clusters that, uh, uh, that Chuck was talking about. There are plenty of industrial facilities out there from which CO2 could be captured that aren't near a storage facility and don't have a CO2 pipeline nearby today. And if we don't want CCUS to be limited to really the central part of the continent, we're gonna need a much bigger pipeline network. I would personally argue for federal eminent domain authority for CO2 pipelines, because there's a, there's a governmental objective being served by those pipelines. And uh, that to me merits uh, federal eminent domain. Uh, also, and by the way, I should say with respect to all of those incentives, those are things that you could see making their way into a federal infrastructure bill, which is, of course, what everybody's talking about right now on Capitol Hill. Also, in, back in uh, December, Congress passed the Use It Act, which reduces federal regulatory burdens for building CCUS infrastructure. Uh, and CCUS advocates need to make sure that that new act gets administered as intended to help speed up the approval process and reduce barriers. And finally, again, you know, the states are the governmental level with authority over property rights, and they can act to facilitate access to pore space and surface area for uh, CCUS facilities. We need more states to do the kind of things that Ken mentioned in his presentation to facilitate CCUS. So thank you very much and uh, uh, turn it over to Mike again. Happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> Fred, thank you very much for that and the coverage. Between the, four, the amongst the four of you, we've hit a, a lot of key areas. Uh, the idea that we've advanced a long way since the CCUS is even tabled, or CCS was tabled say 20 plus years ago is, is amazing. There's a number of projects that are in the pipeline that are out there. Uh, we'll hear more about them as time goes on. We also have a bunch of different issues to work around. Looking at my time. So I've got, I've got something that we 
we didn't touch on, but but it'll it'll help tease some things. The world's three largest producers of uh, fossil fuels are the United States, Russia, and Saudi Arabia. Of the three countries, none of them have a federal price on carbon that's applied to the market. So my question would be, fast answer, how soon do you see that changing and which country will be the first one to put a price on carbon? And open to the four of you, and we won't really debate it, it's just more of a function of food for thought. Well, I'll go first. I think it'll be the US <laughs> and I think it'll be because many of these companies are participating in the global marketplace. So the global court of opinion will likely impact those companies sooner in our country. Yep. I'll, um, I'll, 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 um, I'll say that, you know, a price on carbon can be, you know, of course, uh, a, a, um, many things to many people. And it may, and I'd say that there are actually multiple different prices being put on carbon today that, ex that exist today in various jurisdictions, including those that, that you mentioned. They may be direct and a price on carbon, or it may be an indirect um, other policy that effectively has an inbuilt carbon price. 45Q is a carbon price. But it's directed towards, of course, CCUS deployment. There are lots of other renewable fuel standards, renewable portfolio standards for, uh, for wind and solar. Lots across different sectors, lots of different policies that actually have a carbon price. It's just not a direct carbon price. It's an inbuilt um, shadow. Complicated. Brad and, and Ken, if you want to weigh in. Uh, you know, I was going to say the exact same thing as Nigel. I think he's exactly right. We have a, we have a social cost of carbon calcul calculation. We have the Section 45Q tax credit. Those, you know, in different ways function as a, as a price on carbon. So there are, uh, and, and I'm sure we could come up with others that, that function in that way as well, but at least those two. Yep. Ken? Well, as a country, we flirted with this years ago. Uh, and uh, and bills were introduced that never went anywhere. And uh, I continued to watch the Congress, of course, because we spend a lot of time in Washington, and uh, and and they've never been willing to do that as yet. So I don't see it coming as fast. I I agree with uh, with what Nigel said. Basically, we've got a carbon price. But we have it listed under different names and under under many different uh, uh, categories. Uh, but it is there um, now. Could be the the time when we begin to see that the way for us to move forward is to do this. I'm not sure the Congress has the uh, um, has the guts to to try to do this. If they do. Uh, it's going to be close because there's a chairman of the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee they're going to have to go through to get it. So, the hey, you know, Mike, though, let me, let me just finish the yeah, thought. Go ahead. Many of these major companies have already asked for a price on carbon. Right. Stop with all the hocus pocus. Right. Stop with all the shrouded conversation that many of us can't even figure out because we're not actually able to say it, but we do it around the back door. And, and I think the transparency of something going forward is really what companies want. They want consistency, and that's the thing that de-risks this, this understanding, or, or maybe to use Fred's term, this, this wavering and, and uncertainty that we're going forward into, you know? Yeah, the regulatory process has always been uh, the big bugaboo in this and yeah. continues to be uh, because, uh, you know, we go through the years and uh, uh, things change all the time. There's always regular, what, what's called in what we in the States call regulatory ratcheting, where you'll get a regulation and then 
a year later, you get another regulation that ratchets it, ratchets it, ratchets you up yeah. through the, the uh, regulation you've had before. And so that's the issue. If we could get a clean regulatory process uh, with, you know, with a promise of not to go farther, uh, we might do pretty well. But that's that's hard to guess in this Congress. In yeah. The United well, there, I, I, I threw that on the table because of, in the projects that are getting done, where you have multinationals, they know how they, they've got pricing formulas for carbon built into their into their deck when they try to raise internal capital. So for them, it's no big deal. It's just a function of how they get that covered in, a, in the countries that they operate in. The other part was, is that if there is a price on carbon in any one of these three countries, the first guy that does it, the other two take his market share. And does market share even matter if, if you're of the persuasion that we're on peak demand, uh, not peak oil, the food for thought. And we'll move on to something else. It's uh, well, also very relative to this, and it is the issue of long-term liability. So 10 years ago, when we worked on this stuff, I had this conversation with, with uh, Fred the other day, we actually had some insurers at ready to underwrite long-term liability insurance for stored CO2. Uh, since that window in time has come and gone, we're not so sure that those insurers even exist. So the, how big of an issue is long-term liability going to be if you're a project developer either putting the capture equipment on and it's your CO2 that the third party is going to store or you're the third party that's got the CO2 and you're helping somebody else meet an environmental issue or regulation and capture some federal money, but this is now your responsibility and maybe at least what you're going to do this with from somebody else under a different set of terms and conditions. How big of an issue is long-term liability? And, and we could spend an hour on it, just a short, quick thought piece back. Hey, you wanna look at you wanna look at my slide, Mike? Yeah, uh, we're gonna, we'll, we'll bring your slide up really quick. I wanna see that. I was gonna go to Fred, cause he's, we just had this conversation and I'm hoping you found something out since we just had that talk. And we're gonna go to what you had in your slide, Ken. Sure. Actually, Mike, I have not had a chance to uh, take a look at whether the um, whether the insurers are still offering those policies, but I have not. I certainly have not heard that they are not. But let me um, let me go back to this. Back ten years ago or so, when people were thinking everybody was going to have to capture their CO two in the in the power industry, and we didn't know much about these formations. The issue of risk management was really a big deal at that time. And uh, a company, uh, a consultancy named Industrial Economics up in Boston, Kiara Trebuki and her team did a study on the uh, Jewett, Texas site, which was one of the sites that was considered for the future gen project, but never selected and uh, put in some inputs as to you know, what would happen there if you had a leak. And uh, they found that the, uh, that the liability uh, really the upper end of the liability was in the tens of millions of dollars, uh, which, you know, that was a smaller project than you might see today at some of these mega sites. But most of that liability was driven by H2S uh, leakage rather than CO2 leakage. That gave, I think that gave a lot of people the, uh, some comfort that, look, this is something that can be managed with conventional uh, commercial risk projects. We don't necessarily need a, uh, a separate scheme out there to uh, to handle this. That's the best I can tell you, uh, but I think that's instructive. It's a, it's a good place for people to start in, in thinking about this. Uh, you know, it may have progressed since then, but it's a good place to start. Right. And um, Ken, let's see, and I'm gonna turn to you. You had that slide that showed the states that have given that a high enough priority to do things about trying to address long-term liability. We're going to we're going to pull that up right now so you can see it. Um, so, as you can tell, or as you can see here, uh, yeah, the states have said, "Hey, wait a minute, we're going to de-risk you. We're going to take the liability." Right. Just as an example, uh, in Louisiana. Um, it releases storage operators from any and all liability associated with or related to that storage facility. 
that arises after the issuance of the certificate of completion of injection yep. operations. And uh, it's a 10 year, if, uh, you know, after 10 years, the state assumes liability. Right. So that gives you a, an example of what these states uh, out here, uh, so, you know, passing. So I'm gonna go back to, I'm not gonna go back to talk to Fred about, but I'm gonna go back on the, the slide is that one of the things we might as a group or people that are listening to us might want to poke around on is the, which insurance carriers carriers will be out there to be able to put in insurance down on projects so some of these issues can be put to bed in a way that a commercial project developer is going to advance on. You can have all the technology, right geology, great pipeline, good partners, and you can't insure it, uh, be held, heck of a hard time funding it. Uh, with that, Nigel, is there anything that you'd want to add on top of that? I've got about, I'm going to squeeze enough in that we've got 10 minutes. So I got a couple in the public coming in. Yeah, no, um, not, I think not, nothing uh, really uh, on top of that. There definitely is some more providers, um, new players in the insurance space, uh, you know, new energy risk, uh, part of the AXA group, um, you know, come in and uh, provide looking at not just, um, you know, physical risk, but also commercial risk associated with 45Q. Um, and providing policies to uh, to help uh, de-risk the sites, um, at, whilst also, and it's great to see the state action here to provide clarity. You know, we need we need clarity, of course, for investment, and we need durability, of course, for that investment too. So uh, uh, for uh, for CCUS, so um, they're those things are coming through. People are solving problems all every day. And it's great to see. Yeah. Well, we're, there's a lot of motivated companies out there that have taken up, taken up positions. Uh, and, and when you're, when you're getting ready to put money into a game, you start doing your homework. Uh, I got a question from the audience, uh, Sebastian Looning and says, Bloomberg suggests that green hydrogen will be less expensive than blue hydrogen by 2030. Is this likely? If yes, does it make sense to even get started with blue hydrogen and associated CCS? And uh, Majel, you're smiling, so you're going to answer first. Um, yeah, so I would say, you know, picking winners over losers is never, <laughs> uh, you know, is never a good thing to do based upon projections of, right. um, and of course, the hydrogen market today um, pure hydrogen market today mainly is there for refinery refineries and hydro treating and uh, and of course there's a feedstock for ammonia production fertilizer fertilizers that need large scale um, hydrogen supplies so if you look at the the realities of how hydrogen is produced today it's mainly needed in very very large scales um, a typical steam methane reformer where CCS can be added to it produces a few hundred tons of hydrogen per day. Um, whereas, of course, electrolysis based um, hydrogen is really still down in the several order of magnitudes uh, lower than that. In order for green hydrogen to, what does it mean? In order for green hydrogen to actually um, achieve its cost reduction, it needs to get lots of deployment. It needs to therefore compete against those incumbent technologies and market uses or find new areas that takes time to develop. And of course, fundamentally what it also needs is a lot more electricity supply. And so, uh, as well as water, fresh water supply. So, uh, so, of course, lots of assumptions, predictions, basis on those projections, and it's a really a fatal mistake to make. Yep. Yeah, and, and let, me, let me just pile on if I could. I, I think those kinds of declarations don't help. I think they hurt. They set unrealistic expectations of an energy transition, and in terms of scale, cost 
and physical ability to deliver a result like that. Anybody knows anything about the hydrogen business will tell you that's not going to happen by 2030. Okay. It's just that simple. Now, do we aspire to get there? Sure we do. And we should be on that roadmap to get there. But making declarations like that, that doesn't help. That just hurts, Mike. By the way, just, just for some of the folks in our audience that may not know Chuck, Chuck was from Praxair and was in industrial gas sales and gasification. So uh, when you have comments that you make on this, Chuck, it's coming from deep-seated practical experience. Well, and, and let's say one other thing about this too. Going from gray to blue is no small item in and of itself. It's, it's a challenging next step. It's capital intensive and it's going to make hydrogen more expensive. And so all of those companies that are buying these huge quantities of hydrogen, who are making declarations that they want to be net zero by such and such date, are going to also have to understand that the commodities that they're purchasing, whether that's scope one or scope two or however you analyze it, these commodities are going to become more expensive. And, and that's part of the societal cost of carbon. And that's a bit of the disingenuous conversation that we find ourselves in because people want the energy transition and they don't want to pay a nickel more for it, right? So it's like the old story. It's easy to sit with the angels as long as it doesn't cost anything. And in this case, we're all going to have to recognize this is a transition that will, all, will cost us all. All right. So... Got a question from uh, Lee Hampton, and it's directed towards you, Chuck, and I think it's it's appropriate to what we covered here. Charles, I'm from Houston myself. What will the activation phase really look like for Houston? How fast can we grow these hubs and clusters to get close to full at-scale deployment? So let, let's take a look at that question and take a look at it head on, because there's no point in, in fussing around it. There are some major companies that have major decarbonization opportunities that have made major declarations to want to be net zero by 2050. And these are recent so, declarations. This is a recent uh, declarations, global declarations, right? And they have global footprints. There yeah. are places in the world you can go today, like Rotterdam or Teesside, and you can get a lot of money from the governments there to put the next project in place have a major investment, have a major impact in some regards. And that's all good. We're not in that situation in Houston today, although we have a lot of arrows pointing in the correct direction. I think a big part of our commercialization strategy is to find those effective means of incentivizing this. And it isn't just 45Q, but it's, it's the ability for the states and for the community, the business communities to recognize that this transition is going to cost, it's going to require strategic investment, and it's also going to uh, require policy support. A great example of that is 45Q is a very complicated tax structure that many people can't take advantage of. And so the simplification of that to something that would directly impact the ability to put capital on the ground would go a long way toward incentivizing things. So we've got policy work yet to be done, legislative work yet to be done. I wouldn't imagine we're going to just begin all of this in Houston tomorrow, but we have all the right arrows in the right direction for it. Yep. Um, we have about a, we've got four other questions from the public. We don't have enough time. We can respond to them by print. We're going to be, Done at three, which is just coming right up around the corner here. Nathan, which a number of us know, uh, has asked this question, which is pertinent. It's, a, it's, a easy, it's not an easy question. It's not an easy answer. It's a short question. How much of CCS costs are in the capture versus the storage? And will the change and how will this change as we go to scale? Who wants to take that one? So, um, so I'll, I'll quickly answer. Um, it, it depends, but if we start our implementation program based upon the low hanging fruit, the lowest cost options, of course, that basically means 
options where there's pure streams of CO2 that are being processed, separated already, or um, and therefore the majority of the cost is actually in storage. But of course, as more incentive is available um, and cost of capture comes down, um, then of course we can broaden the amount of deployment to streams that also that that are lower concentration, lower pressure um, CO2, and uh, and then but then of course uh, the capture um, proportion goes up in the total cost. I'm going to throw some off the edge of this, and we're going to wrap it up. So in the last 60 days. There have been 11 LNG cargoes to trade hands as carbon neutral LNG. One cargo of crude oil for sure that's been shown up in the press. I understand there's been several more around the same time. And I've actually heard there's been two cargoes of coal that have transacted as carbon neutral commodities. This was all done by professional people, well-known companies. These are not, not a third party that formed for the occasion. And it's being done by using uh, carbon offsets, voluntary carbon markets from different markets. And they've created a, a formula that makes sense. If we do large scale storage of CO2 in the United States, there's a carbon credit value for that CO2 being retired, put to bed, physically locked away. We're getting, we get money for the 45Q as a tax process, but the rigorous MRV requirements to qualify for that also layer on top of the CO2 you've stored in these geologic formations as likely places to create volumes of carbon credits, which by these cargos that have been done, add a new value proposition to something we've really not paid a lot of attention to lately. Um, with that, I, I mean, I could stay here. In fact, I think all of us could stay here and talk this for another two hours. We can't. And so before I wrap us up, is there Anything any one of the four you guys want to kind of leave with before we call it a day? I mean, I, I, I could, Ken, you and I could just go on for four hours on three of your slides. Yeah, you bet. You bet. I, I would say, I would want to say thank you again to USDA for sponsoring this and to you, Mike, especially uh, for, for your time and effort. Uh, uh, you know, you, you said a lot about us, but you didn't say very much about yourself. And, and you are certainly uh, one of the key people in Washington who work in this area and, uh, and you've been in it for a long time. So you're very well respected and we all appreciate the opportunity to appear with you. Well, thank you, John. I appreciate that coming from you, really do. Um, with that, going once, going twice, and to the people that did send us some questions, we'll try to answer them by, by, by note back. Thank you for all who attended. Thank you, gentlemen, and Michelle and Alex. And we're, we're here, we're done. Uh, and another one to, to go home to. And thank you all. I'm, I'm done. Michelle, I'm going to let, let you have it at this point, And uh, we'll go. Thank you. All right, thank once you. again, thank you all very much for, uh, for being here. It's uh, great to see the three of you together. Seems to happen quite often, but we enjoy it every time. Um, <clears throat> big thank you to uh, all of our presenters and to our audience for listening and submitting your questions. Uh, all the presentations, as well as a recording of the webinar, will be available on the website tomorrow morning at usea.org slash events on the calendar page. Um, our next webinar is with uh, Jane Nakano, who will present on her report, The Geopolitics of Critical Mineral Supply Chain which will happen on April 27th from 1 to 2 p.m. EST. Uh, registration is also available on our website. Uh, so once again, thank you all, everyone. Uh, this is great. We're looking forward to seeing you again, and everyone be safe. Thank you. Thanks.